For the visitors, my name is Patrick Mbogwa. I'm an, a member of KVC and one of the elders in church, and always happy to welcome visitors. We are continuing with the book of Nehemiah, and today I'm going to look at chapter 5 from verse 14 to chapter 6, uh, verse 19, to the end of chapter 6. When Craig was preaching last week, uh, I called him on Monday, and I complained to him that he had really messed my sermon because I wanted to speak on warfare. And I told him, you know, now you're making me go back to the drawing board. Uh, and I don't like you very much. Um, he had nothing much. He, he didn't say sorry. He said, well, that's what the Lord laid on my heart. And as I pondered on this uh, passage, it became clear to me that Craig was actually setting the, the foundation for me to build the walls as it were this week. And uh, so he, he wasn't wrong. Uh, I think we were in the same spirit and he was setting the agenda uh, for me. So I want to start this week by looking at walls. I want to talk about walls a bit. And for those guys who are builders, like Eric, if you think I've made a mistake, please see me after the service so that I don't make the, sec the same mistake in the second service. So there are many types of walls. And I have a picture of three walls there. There's a retaining wall, a perimeter wall, and a coastal wall. Other walls are exterior house walls. They are walls that divide rooms. You have, uh, some people call them perimeter walls that demarcate the boundary of, uh, of land. Some have security walls. Um, so walls serve different purposes. And I want to speak about walls a bit uh, as we go into this, into this passage. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is living and active. Your word that is sharper than any double-edged sword. We thank you, Lord, that your word uh, does not go back void. And so, Father, I want to pray for everyone who's here this morning that as we sit before your word and you tell us in John that you are the word, that, Lord, we would be submitted to you, that, Father, we'd allow you to speak to us corporately and individually. And, Father, for me this morning and as I've meditated on this passage, your word is victory. Your word is all that we need. And Father, I want to pray that as we leave these doors, we will live with a bounce in our walk because we have met your word that is victorious. Father, we lift you up, we surrender ourselves to you now, and we yield ourselves to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So all serve different purposes. The retaining wall uh, that's to your left is built where there's been an excavation and soil has been exposed. So to avoid the soil from collapsing, you put a retaining wall so that it holds the soil back. The wall itself uh, could be next to a house which has walls, say these outside walls of this building. And that house itself has walls inside, dividing the rooms as the builder wanted. The perimeter wall demarcates where the house sits to make sure that everybody knows this is private, you can be outside, but this is my turf, you can't come in. And each wall has a specific purpose. For instance, if the retaining wall during heavy rain was not built properly, it will collapse and all the soil will be washed off and probably uh, lead to the peril of the house uh, that's next to it. So each wall, despite being unique in its own way, for example, the coastal wall keeps away the sea from getting onto the land. All the walls have a specific purpose, but each of them works in consonance with the other walls. So we've been looking at Nehemiah's construction of the wall in its totality so far. But I want to take you back to Nehemiah chapter 3, which deals with some specificities, specificities. I found it hard to say that word, but I insisted I would use it. Uh, 
specificities about the wall builders that I thought would help us grasp what I feel is the message for today. If you turn to Nehemiah chapter 3, it has 32 verses, each mentioning persons who are building particular parts of the wall, 32 of them. So for instance, if you go to verse 1, it tells us that Eliashib the high priest and his fellow priests rebuilt the sheep gate. So he was in charge of the sheep gate, part of the wall leading to the sheep gate. If you go to verse 8, for instance, there's a mention of Uziel, the son of Hahaya, one of the goldsmiths who was also making repairs. A goldsmith making repairs to the wall. Next to him was Hananiah, a perfumer who also made repairs, and they fortified Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. So you have a goldsmith, you have a perfumer who are both working on the wall. If you go to verse 14, uh, that guy had a rather unique part of the wall to, to rebuild. He's called Malkijah, the son of Rehab, leader of the district of Beth Hacherem, who repaired the refuse or the dung gate. Now, I don't think any of us would have volunteered to build that part of the wall. The list goes on for 32 verses. Last week, Craig mentioned that each family had a part of the wall to build, but that each part was necessary for the whole, for the whole wall. And of course, that means that if one family didn't do a good job, then it compromised the whole wall. Similarly, for the wall examples that I've given, if the perimeter wall, for instance, develops a crack and collapses, if it had an electric wire on, t on top, then the electric wire is compromised and it doesn't offer the security that it's meant to. Or if the retaining wall collapses and the soil is washed off, then you lose all that soil. So if any of the builders in chapter three did not do a good job with part of their wall, it would compromise the whole wall. And so each of the 32 people was as important as the 32 people put together. Nobody was weaker than any other. Nobody was less important than any other. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, I picked verse 12, 14, 26, and 27, where we read, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Now please hold that thought for a minute. I'll come back to it. When you go to chapter one and two of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is tasked by God to build the wall of Jerusalem. That's the big picture. When you come to chapter three, the one I've just uh, picked a few verses, the 32 people who are listed there each had an individual part in building the whole wall. So there's a big picture of the big wall, and then there's a small picture of each of the 32 families building their small part to complete the full picture. So when we come back to 1 Corinthians 12, I want to remind us as we begin this uh, passage that each of us is a part of the big picture that's comprised of Christians who've been tasked by Jesus, as he did in Matthew um, 28, 19 and 20, to advance the kingdom of God. So he said, go out, make disciples. But each one of us has a part to play in that big picture that Jesus gave. And so each of us has a part of the wall that we need to build. So I want to, with that brief uh, background, begin by asking you this. Which part of the wall have you been building? Or which part of the wall are you building? Or what has the Lord told you to build in the great task of making disciples of men? What is my part of the wall? I want you to, answer, to think about that question and ask yourself, what's my part of the wall? in the big task. Or perhaps you don't even know that you have a wall to build. 
and that you've been sitting and going through the book of Nehemiah thinking, Nehemiah, that was your brief, that was your task. You're sitting as a spectator, just watching what's transpiring and thinking that you have no part in the whole story. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The NIV says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. So as you're thinking about the wall, and you're part of the wall. Remember you're a worker. A worker isn't a worker in a vacuum. You work to do something. And my position this morning is that you're working to advance the kingdom of God. Proverbs 25, 28 says this, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. That's the NKJV. The NIV says, like a city whose walls are broken down is a man who lacks self-control. So if you can't answer this question right now, what is my part of the wall? Let me help by perhaps proposing that if you don't have self-control, if you have no rule over your own spirit, then maybe that's where you need to start. That's the wall you need to start building. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And I think the walls here are righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So if you have no wall to build, if you don't have an answer, let me suggest to think about those as walls you could build for yourself. Now, this is how I want to define a wall for the purpose of our passage this morning. For me, a wall signifies a Christian's God-ordained purpose in advancing the kingdom of God. That is the wall that I want you to think about today for yourself. It is God's ordained purpose for your life in advancing the kingdom of God. So you have to be a follower of Christ, first and foremost, because only then does he have a purpose towards advancing his kingdom. So what purpose has God ordained for your life? What do you think God has ordained, brought you, created you for? Craig said last week that whenever we advance the kingdom of God, the enemy will be enraged and will come at us. He looked at Nehemiah chapter 4, all the way to chapter 5, verse 13, where we found Sanbalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites seeking to destabilize the Jews. They mocked them in chapter 4, verse 1. They conspired to attack Jerusalem and create confusion in chapter 4, verse 8. They scared them in verse 9. And then in chapter 5, verse 1 to 13, the enemy now causes some of the Jews to oppress their fellow Jews. So the enemy is attacking them to disrupt their unity, which has resulted in the building of the wall. He doesn't succeed. And so now when we come to our passage for today, the enemy changes stuck. So one of the things I want you to understand about the enemy and spiritual warfare is that he never gives up, but he'll change stuck when one strategy doesn't work, he changes to something else. And so in this passage, the enemy now moves from looking at the Jews corporately and now focuses on Nehemiah individually. He focuses on one part of the body. And as I've read from 1 Corinthians 12, when one part of the body is affected, the whole body is affected. He knew if he could destabilize Nehemiah, then he would succeed in affecting the whole project on the wall. And this week, I think, as Jeanette was saying, the enemy has been trying to destabilize Jeanette so that she can't lead us in worship. Uh, and so it's been a big battle this whole week for her. But as she stands here, and as you sang, the victory of the Lord Jeanette has been on you the whole week. And it's declared and established this morning. 
But my focus this morning is not on the enemy or the suffering, but on the fact that God has already provided the Christian with a counter strategy to Satan's schemes. And that strategy is available to all of us. I find that Christians sometimes, you're so afraid of spiritual warfare, you're afraid of Satan, rather than focusing on he who gives us the victory. And so this morning, I don't want us to think about the enemy's schemes, but I want us to focus on God's victory that's available to us. And that's what I want you to walk out from here with. So remember, as part of KVC's body, you are a potential victim for the enemy to try and get you down so that he can bring down the rest of us. And so I want to draw parallels with Nehemiah from chapter 5, 14 to the end of 6, how he faced spiritual warfare as an individual, and then pray that in the same way you would also be able to adapt the same principles for yourself. I've broken down the passage into three parts. One, the fear of God. Two, the threat of man. And three, victory from God. The fear of God, the threat of man, and victory from God. In Nehemiah 5 verse 9, we see Nehemiah telling the Jewish oppressors that what they are doing is not good. He then asks, should you not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the nations, our enemies. And then in chapter 5, verse 15, we read that the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. So it appears to me that the task that Nehemiah is given by the Lord he is not doing it more to fulfill the task, but more because of the fear of the Lord. That is his primary focus, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord stopped him from oppressing the Jews like the other governors did. The fear of the Lord stopped him from laying heavy burdens on the people and stopped him from serving his own needs rather than those that he'd been given charge over. So one of the things about spiritual warfare that I want us to think about this morning and about your life, about your purpose, about your building of your part of the wall is that there has to be a bigger motivation to fulfill your purpose than just achieving that purpose. For Nehemiah, finishing the wall was secondary to doing it out of his fear of the Lord. And this brings me to my first pointer in spiritual warfare, that the fear of the Lord will dictate the conduct of the Christian. The fear of the Lord will dictate the conduct of the Christian. So what is the fear of the Lord? Is it shaking and trembling? Is it fearing him? Is it not wanting to be near him? Is it cowering when you know he's near? For my answer, I turn to the book of Proverbs, and Proverbs has 19 verses, different verses that talk about the fear of the Lord. But I want to narrow down to two verses that I think capture what the fear of the Lord is. Proverbs 1, 29 to 31, and then 33 says, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way, but whoever listens to me will dwell safely and will be secure without the fear of evil. So because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel. And then Proverbs 2, 1 to 9 says this, and I want you to note what I've underlined. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply, my heart, and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, 
If you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. The words I've underlined are all verbs. And I learned about verbs a long time ago, and it was a doing what? You receive, you treasure, you incline, you apply, you cry, you lift, you seek, you search. Verse 5, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. So for me, the fear of the Lord is an active pursuit of who God is and what he desires. Because you know, because I know that without him, I am nothing. You are nothing. When you fear God, you understand that only he can guide you appropriately. Only he is the ultimate power. He is above all things and nothing can stand against him. Even you, can't stand against him. In Matthew 10, 27 to 31, Jesus taught his disciples what the fear of God is. This is what he said. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. But rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. Luke 12, 3 to 7, which referred to the same teaching, says this. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So the fear of God is an appreciation of who God is, that he is ultimately above all things. The fear of God, as Nehemiah exercised it, is that when Tobias, Sanballat, and Geshem comes to you, because of the fear of God, you know they cannot overcome you. They will not stop him from building the wall. The fear of God means understanding that the one in charge is God. He has absolute authority of your life and everything else is subject to God. So when Satan attacks you, because you fear God and turn to him, you run to him because you can't run anywhere else, then God, as Proverbs 2, 7 says, is your shield and guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of you, his saint. Satan will not and cannot overcome you. In other words, you cannot successfully engage in spiritual warfare without the fear of God. Because the fear of God is a shield you need when facing the attacks of the enemy because he is the source you go to to overcome the enemy's attack. So, what's the threat of man? I picked this up from Nehemiah 6, 1 to 14. And the threat of man is one of the tactics that Satan uses to disrupt your wall construction. I'm coming from the point of you have a point, you have a part of the wall that you're constructing. You have a calling on your life. You have a purpose on your life. Satan knows it. And his work is to try and disrupt that. So when San Balat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of the enemies realize that they cannot shake the Jews building the wall, they decide on a new strategy. I want us to go to Nehemiah 6, 1 to 2, where he says, 
after they heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no bricks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me. Now this is an aside from what I'm talking about, but I thought it was important. Do you notice what's in brackets? The NIV puts a certain phrase in brackets. Though at that time I had not hung the gates. And I stopped and I thought about that. Why, why is that in brackets? In the context of what I want to speak about uh, this morning. And what I felt the Lord impress on me is this. That the enemy will take advantage of any areas that you've left unprotected to get to you. It didn't matter how strong a wall Nehemiah and the Jews built. It didn't matter how big it was, how high it was, how solid it was. But if they left gaps in it by not putting up gates, it could still be breached. And so to you as you're building the wall, what gates have you ignored to hang up in your life and that are allowing the enemy to get at you? And this took me to Galatians 5, 19 to 21, that reminds us that the works of the flesh or acts of sinful nature, uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions like the other governors, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. That's Galatians 5, 19 and 21. And then in verse 22, we read, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I do believe that these are the gates that some of us need to hang up around our walls to ensure that the enemy has no gap and he can't win the battle against us. For instance, where you have self-control, you can't find revelries. Revelries are uncontrollable, uh, what, say parties, uncontrollable enjoyment, out of control fun, out of control everything. If you're eating and in revelry, you'll eat until you vomit, you can't stop. If you're drinking, you'll drink until you black out. If you're partying, instead of going home at say 9.30, for me when I go to a party, I go home at 9.30, I don't know about you. <laughs> Instead of going home at 9.30, you go home at 10. That's revelry. <laughs> so you are all guilty. <laughs> Ask my son, don't we go home at 9.30? Yes. <laughs> so this is what I'm trying to say. The gates that you don't hang are the things that you allow the devil to come in. When you engage in an extreme drunkenness, for instance, you allow the devil to come in with lack of self-control and you end up doing things you don't need to and you cannot defeat him. So check your gates, check your gates. Let me come back to Sanbalat. They now devise a strategy where they go to Nehemiah in verse two, they ask to come to the villages in the plain of Ono, but he doesn't, knowing that they intend to harm him. In chapter six, verse six and seven, they accuse him that he's planning to rebel and become the king of the Jews, and that he's even appointed prophets to proclaim him king. And he rubbishes those accusations in verse eight and realizes that it was all a scare tactic. In verse nine, Nehemiah prays that the Lord would strengthen his hands. Why did he make that prayer? If you go to Zechariah in Zechariah 4.6, it says this, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by what? But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Spiritual warfare through the threat of man will never overcome the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Spiritual warfare through the threat of man will never overcome the power of the Holy Spirit. So when Satan has used the threat of man against you, maybe through a bad boss, a threatening policeman, a rogue parliament, like I think I'm experiencing, whatever it is, you have certainty of victory only when you call out to the Spirit of the Lord for deliverance. Nehemiah prayed to the Lord to strengthen his hands. You cannot win in your own strength, which is what many of us try to do. In chapter 6, verse 10 to 13, they changed tack again. They tried through an informer they had hired called Shemaiah to get him so scared that some people are coming to kill him that with Shemaiah's very uh, comforting solution of let's go and hide in the temple, they would guide him to the temple, which would be sacrilege, and then they would use that against him. But we read in verse 12 that Nehemiah perceived their wicked schemes and refused to go into the temple. Now I want to draw your attention to a few things. In verse 2 of chapter 6, we read that Nehemiah knew that Sanballat and the others intended to harm him. In chapter 6, verse 8, he tells them that they have invented their accusations against him. So he knows that those accusations are fake, they're inventions. In verse 12, he says that he perceived that God had not sent the false prophet Shemaiah to prophesy about the danger to him. What's a common thread here? That one key strategy against the enemy is discernment. And discernment comes from the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12.10 tells us that one of the spiritual gifts is the discerning of spirits. Discernment comes from the Lord because he sees and knows what we cannot with our human capacity see or know. In 1 Samuel 16.7 we read, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now in spiritual warfare, I see discernment as an x-ray that the enemy cannot escape from. That when he comes near me, because of the Lord enabling me to discern what he's up to, I'll immediately see whether this is from God or not, as Nehemiah did. And because of that discernment, Nehemiah was not distracted from his work because he, he rubbished any accusation that was false. He knew when something was being set up against him, and so he kept his focus on the wall. Because of the fear of the Lord, Nehemiah totally relied on God. And then God was able to reveal what the enemy's schemes were to him, which helped him to avoid them and allowed him to finish his task. Let me say this again. Discernment is from the Lord. Discernment is not your experience as a Christian for many years. Discernment is not your sharp mind. Discernment is not how clever you are. Discernment is not how schemious you can be. Discernment is revelation by and from God to you. And you need discernment in spiritual warfare. You won't win anything because Satan is devious, probably more devious than you are. And so you need God's discernment. Finally, the victory from God. Nehemiah 6, 15 and 19 to 19. I wish I could have started with this part rather than the other one, but I needed to build my case. Now remember the wall had been in ruins for hundreds of years, over 100 years. And then we read in Nehemiah 6, 15 to 16, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Now I read an archeological article this week, 
uh, just trying to figure out about this uh, wall. So the article says that the city of Jerusalem was 136 acres in size. Uh, 136 acres is big, that's all I can say. Now the wall that Nehemiah built in those 52 days, these are its dimensions. The wall was five meters wide, so width. It was five meters wide, so maybe from one, two, three, four, five, maybe up to here. That's how the wall, how wide it was. And the wall was 12 meters high. So it's five meters wide, 12 meters high. Uh, I don't know how high 12, maybe to the top of the roof, 12 meters. So it's a huge wall, 36 acres round. It wasn't done with our modern day uh, machinery, as we read. In fact, it was being done by goldsmiths, perfumers. Uh, so amazing that a perfumer is doing a wall, a goldsmith which probably means they had some lawyers there as well, <laughs> uh, building walls. It was done in 52 days only. Now guys, I, I stopped there and wanted to come up with a very clever uh, statement to, to capture what I felt and what I feel when I read this. So it took me two days to try and come up with something that would slap you. Um, this is what I came up with, and it is nowhere near what I wanted to say. That God guarantees victory. I wish I, I could speak in Kikuyu to, to tell you <laughs> that God guarantees victory. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter, Jeanette, which Sanbalat, which Tobiah, which Geshem, which Arab, which boss, which anybody is tormenting you. It doesn't matter what accusations have been leveled against you. It does not matter. God guarantees victory. As long as you're focused on fulfilling the destiny that God has purposed for you, as long as the fear of the Lord is your lifestyle, as long as God remains God, and remember, he remains God because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God guarantees victory. And when that victory comes, everybody will see it, even your worst enemies. So do you and I live such lives that God's working in us is noticed? Forget even being noticed by your enemies. Can your friends, do your friends notice God working in you? Let's leave the enemies candle fast. I read one commentary that puts it this way. When something has the fingerprints of God on it, all our enemies notice it also. Let me ask the worship team to come up. When something has the fingerprints of God on it, all our enemies notice it also because God guarantees victory. Many years ago, I worked for a very bad boss, a very bad man, who tried to get me to do all sorts of evil things. And we used to have very big fights with him. And usually he'd fire people at the slightest provocation. He looks at you and he thinks you have you're not looking very smart, he fires you. I never lost my job, and guys used to ask me, how come you never seem to be affected? So one day we had a, a terrible fallout, terrible, terrible, terrible. And he looked at me and told me, if you don't agree with what I am saying, I'm going to fire you. So I looked at him, we were in his office, I looked at him straight in the face, and I told him, you have no ability to fire me. You have no capacity to fire me. Now, I honestly believe it's because he used to have a very white table that he didn't jump across to come and strangle me for saying such a ridiculous thing. So he asked me who in the world I thought I was, telling him I can't fire him. I looked at him, 
In fact, I wrote verbatim what I told him. This is what I told him. For your information, this is my boss I'm telling. It is God who brought me here, and it is him who will take me away when he thinks I have fulfilled my work here. And what I want you to know is that I will not be party to all the illegal things you are trying to get me to do. And then I stormed off and banged his door and went home. Believe it or not, when I came back the following day, he asked me into his office and called for a truce. Now the only thing I did when I went home was to tell Faith, my wife, what I'd done and to ask her, please pray for me that uh, I'm okay. <laughs> now if I escaped the strangling from my boss, I escaped strangling from Faith and I think the only reason was because our baby was, our daughter was just two months old and she didn't want to be a single parent, so she couldn't kill me. <laughs> but my boss told me, I'm sorry about what happened yesterday. I will allow you to do the right things and all the wrong things, this is a true story. <laughs> all the wrong things I will be doing without letting you know. True story. This is what I want you guys to walk out with today. God is a God of victory to anyone who relies on him absolutely. And the reason we succumb to Satan's warfare is that we think we can handle him in our own strength. Or as I pointed out earlier, you've left gates unhung. Nehemiah was fully assured of God's help and had the fear of God. Reliance upon him ensured that he was able to remain focused despite the warfare targeting him, and he finished the job. Everyone had to notice. Finally, this is what I want to say. You will never win spiritual warfare against you as long as you compromise your position in the Lord. If you keep the Lord there, if you keep looking up to him, you will always win. So how does an individual overcome warfare against them? Fear God, rely on God and not man, and claim God's victory. Amen.